It is surely obvious, even to those who don't play such games, that Rogue is the game from which the term roguelike derives. While apparently not the first roguelike game, that honor goes to Beneath Apple Manor, according to David Craddock's amazing book, Dungeon Hacks, How NetHack, Angband, and Other Roguelikes Changed the Course of Video Games, which you all should read, by the way, it did set in stone many of the mainstays of the genre, and was the most widely emulated in the early years of roguelike development. Most versions of this game that I could track down would not run on my modern 64-bit Windows-based machine. One notable exception was Classic Rogue, a modern clone that maintains all original gameplay, but updates the original ASCII graphics with some simple but attractive tiles, and adds a few sound effects. I did manage to find a copy of Win Rogue. It retains the original ASCII graphics and lack of sound, and I considered playing this version to get a closer feel to the original. I was dissuaded by a couple of things. Firstly, even official releases of Rogue by the original developers included graphics and sound in some later versions, and they've made it clear that they would have used graphics from the beginning, had it been technically feasible at the time. Secondly, Win Rogue is a clone of a clone. According to the website, it is based on something called Rogue 5.3-Clone. And thirdly, while Classic Rogue initially proved tricky to control, Win Rogue was even more so. So Classic Rogue is the version this review will be based off of. What's the story? In ages past, the magicians of old created the Amulet of Yendor to remind mankind of its origins. This sacred relic was then stolen by the evil Dungeon Lord, who despised it for its purity. He hid the amulet down in the deepest depths of the Dungeon of Doom. At some point in the past, you climbed down into the dungeon in search of the amulet. The magicians have blessed you in your quest with a gift of eternal life. But this gift is tainted by the Dungeon Lord, for each time you die, you reawaken at the top of the dungeon. Your memories faded, and you must begin the quest anew. You can no longer remember your name. There is only the quest. You are the rogue. What's it like? By modern roguelike standards, Rogue offers a pared-down, even Spartan experience. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's easy to get lost and crushed under the weight of the extraneous things that pack the heavies of the genre. Indeed, it's interesting that while the games that sprung up in Rogue's wake have been expanded and expanded and expanded for decades, here we find the same unevolved gameplay that came into being nearly 40 years ago except perhaps as pertains to presentation in the case of Classic Rogue. In linking to the story, where the conceit is that your character is the same person, game after game, simply lacking a memory of his previous journeys in the dungeon, it makes sense that there are no character classes or races to choose from here. Every game starts with you as the Rogue, with the same exact equipment, the same 12 hit points, the same 16 strength. It's simple, and it gets you into the action quickly, but it would add greater interest and a wider range of tactics if players had some say in their starting character. Classic Rogue contains a menagerie of just 26 monsters. Some of them do have interesting abilities. The Aquator can degrade your worn armor with every hit. The Leprechaun can steal some gold before teleporting away. The Ice Monster can strike from a distance, hurling frost that will actually freeze you in place if it hits you, and which can sometimes bounce back and kill the Ice Monster instead. The Nymph steals inventory items, then disappears. There's a decent enough array of items to find and play with, too. Weapons, armor, breastplates only. Scrolls, potions, rings, wands, and staves all make appearances, with an interesting and varied selection among each category. Making matters more interesting, nothing you find will begin as identified in terms of any enchantments or curses that may be upon it. You have to figure out what everything does through trial and error, or through the use of identification scrolls, though these presumably you have to identify through trial and error. Once you've identified a specific object, you'll always recognize objects of that type for what they are, at least within the confines of a single playthrough. In one game, red potions, for instance, may heal you, and if you've figured that out by downing the potion or by identifying it with a scroll, all future red potions you find during that run will be labeled as healing potions. Your next run through, though, those red potions may make you fall asleep if you drink them. So every game, the identification of all objects is scrambled. It's an idea that many follow-up roguelikes adapted pretty verbatim, sometimes effectively, sometimes not so much. Here, it's at the heart of the gameplay, though, and in a game with minimal overall content, it's a layer of excitement that definitely adds to the experience. For the most part, dungeon layouts are repetitive and self-similar. Rectangular rooms adjoined to narrow corridors, always with an intervening door. There is the occasional secret door to worry about, and sometimes the game throws a corridor that branches or even turns into a sort of mini-maze, but mostly it's just rectangles adjoined to other rectangles by crooked lines. 
Aesthetically, that can get old fast. Aside from doors, which block line of sight, secret doors, which you have to search for, piles of gold, objects, or a single staircase per level, the rooms are devoid of all furnishings. Definitely not much by way of variety in the design. Classic Rogue does eliminate some of the tedium of traversing those crooked line corridors, though, by adding a sort of automated movement, if you choose to avail yourself of it. Holding down control and pressing a direction key will have your character automatically follow the hallway, or the wall if in a room, until reaching a door or branch in the corridor, or some other reason to stop. As you progress downwards, more and more of the rooms are dark. On the first level, every room you enter is well lit. You can see all the way to the other end immediately upon entering, and all monsters, except invisible ones, and room contents, are readily displayed. Darkened rooms, by contrast, only allow you to see one square distant. Even as you move about a darkened room, the floor tiles you previously saw disappear from your map, though the walls and doors remain marked. And from the second floor downward, these types of rooms become increasingly prevalent until by level 10 or so, all rooms are darkened. There is a remedy in the form of a wand of light, though these seem fairly rare and in any event carry only a set number of charges before growing useless. The darkened areas do add a slight differentiation between room types, adding a little variety that the game may need more of. And I'm sure that they serve a purpose in terms of game balance, making it more difficult to prepare to face certain types of enemies than if you could see them from far distant. For instance, in lit areas, you could more readily choose to take out heavy hitters or dangerous opponents with missile weapons. Or, more to the point, safely remove your armor before that aquator starts ruining it. The darkness largely prevents this, making certain enemies more dangerous than they otherwise would be. But it also makes the game less tactical. It's now standard operating procedure for me to just strip off my armor, or put on a breastplate I don't mind having wrecked, as soon as I reach dungeon level 8, about when aquators first show up and stay that way till about level 15, when they seem to be mostly gone. If my strategy ends up identical each playthrough, that's not tactics, that's habit. The constant darkened areas grow tedious too. They constitute the bulk of the map less than halfway through your descent, forcing you to carefully step about every room, bouncing back and forth between walls to map the boundaries of the area, and to be sure you haven't missed anything at the center. And one final gripe about them, if you ever read a scroll of mapping, the full map gets revealed to you, except the floors of darkened rooms. The problem with this is that, remember, the floors of darkened rooms unreveal themselves as soon as you leave their vicinity, appearing as black, unexplored squares once again. This means it's actually harder to tell where you have and haven't been on a level after you use a scroll of mapping, since the telltale walls you would normally use to ascertain if you've visited a darkened room before will all be revealed. You essentially have to re-explore every area to be sure you've gotten everything. Gold plays a minimal but interesting role in the game. As in pretty much every dungeon crawler, it's down there for the taking, and if you're a typical old-school D&D player, you want it. But in terms of gameplay, it doesn't actually do anything. That's not entirely true. Your score at the end of the game is equal to the amount of gold you've collected. If you want to compete against yourself on the scoreboard or against friends, gold is your one quantifiable. But the thing is, there already is something you're supposed to be competing against, the victory condition of the game. You're here to bring the Amulet of Yendor back to the surface. Do that, and you win. Fail to do that, and regardless of how much gold you found, you lose. I think the mechanic of gold equals score has some merit, and we'll see it again in certain other roguelikes later. And I do like the fact that there is a persistent scoreboard. In a game where, as in most roguelikes, 99% of your playthroughs are going to end in failure, the score gives something tangible to improve upon with each run but going for it can be actively detrimental to your chances of winning. Leprechauns, as one example, always sit atop a pile of gold. They won't bother you if you don't attack them, and there's not a lot of reason to attack them unless you want the gold. Sure, they only do one point of damage if they hit you, and steal some of your gold, and killing them will earn you a little experience, but are they worth the aggravation for something that won't functionally aid you in your quest? At the very least, Venturing across a room to pick up some useless gold leaves you at a risk of stepping on a hidden trap and, even if you can reach the pile of gold unscathed, means you've expended time that could otherwise have been spent progressing toward victory. And time is not on your side in this game. Classic Rogue uses a hunger clock to good effect. Monsters do seem to slowly repopulate levels, even after those levels have been cleared, and were it not for the necessity of food, the ideal strategy might be to linger on dungeon level 1, until you've gone up a whole lot of character levels, to leave you safer as you descend. Try that in this game though, and you'll die, as running out of food leaves you increasingly weak, susceptible to fainting, and, 
I would surmise, though I haven't actually seen it happen, death by starvation. Food needs to be replenished, and the only way to keep finding it is to keep exploring new levels. It's a good incentive. I mentioned traps earlier, and they do bear brief talking about. There seem to be several different types of traps, ranging from simple arrows that cause a little damage, to bear traps that also freeze you in place for a time, or teleport traps that transport you to a random point and then leave you disoriented and wandering randomly for a few turns. There doesn't seem to be any way to remove traps once you've discovered them, though, or indeed to discover them in any way other than blindly stumbling into them. And this can be problematic if, for instance, a teleport trap blocks you from the way you need to proceed. You can find and wield different missile weapons, and both potions and certain weapons can be thrown at enemies to great effect. It's a nice touch that you need to switch to your bow and back to your melee weapon, rather than having both available to you at all times. That creates a layer of tactics that might otherwise be missed. But missile weapons can only be fired in the eight cardinal directions, necessitating you to artificially line your character up with enemies before shooting, which can be costly if that enemy is bearing down on you. It doesn't help either that the period floor tiles can be hard to differentiate, and in this version at least they're not perfectly square tiles, but taller than they are wide making it hard to figure out if you're diagonally aligned with an enemy. I'm occasionally off by as much as two squares in my aim, especially if the enemy is distant. Rogue has an interesting feature, in that wearing rings automatically increases the rate at which you grow hungry. I'm not sure I like it, but I think it's there to offset the overwhelming power some of the rings would otherwise convey. Poison is handled simply. Each time you get poisoned, you lose one or more points of strength. This is presumably bad. The only explanation as to strength's in-game effects that I could find in either the original Rogue manual or the text file that accompanies Classic Rogue is this. Quote, The higher the number, the stronger you are. Yeah, sure. Basic statistics, more equals more. But what does it do? In a game with only two player attributes, strength and hits, that's an important question to answer. The most common way to lose strength is to have a rattlesnake score a solid hit against you. You can also lose it by drinking poison potions, and there are dart traps that can poison you too. You can restore your strength to its highest level by drinking a potion of restore strength. But even when my strength was reduced from 16 to 7, I noticed no tangible difference to the damage I was doing. It's difficult to assess that, though, as the game is pretty precious about revealing any hard data. It didn't seem to influence what weapons or armor I could equip, either. Rogue maintains a sense of mystery by eschewing numbers for the most part. You're told that you've scored a good hit on an enemy, but not told explicitly how much damage you've done. When you level up, you go from an untitled adventurer to guild novice to apprentice to journeyman, rather than to second, third, or fourth level. It does maintain a certain ambience by divorcing you from the reality that this is all a game of mathematics and dice rolls, though as I'd argue above, it does so at the expense of clarity. The original game came with an attractive and detailed instruction manual. At least the Epic's version did. You can still find it. I'll include both a link to it and the game below. It's nicely illustrated, and opens with an atmospheric story about who you are and what you're doing. It is odd that the story emphasizes that your character can't even remember his or her own name, but the first thing the game does on starting is prompt you to enter one. How else would you differentiate the high scores, though, I suppose? Those names are also used in .rec files. Loading one of these will give what amounts to a complete video replay of the game to date, turn by turn, and can be used, for example, to verify a victory to other players. That's pretty cool! While we're on the topic, though, if you want to load a previously saved game, you have to, immediately upon starting the game, type the name of the character from the saved game into the prompt that's asking you to name your new character. This is clumsy, prone to error, and counterintuitive. It's also not explained anywhere, so I'm glad I figured it out. Instead of the pretty manual that came with Epix's Rogue, Classic Rogue comes with but a simple .txt file. But even that provides you with most of everything you need to know to play. One helpful detail they left out was to make sure your numlock key was turned off if you intend to use your numpad to move. The game was a little trickier to control until I figured that out. If you do get lost, pressing the question mark key brings up a helpful list of all key commands, which is quite handy, especially considering the number of key commands there are. By comparison to some later, more complex roguelikes, it's far from excessive. But it should be noted that even Rogue contains more than 30 key bindings. And that's excluding the 8 keys used for movement and the repetition keys of 0 through 9, which are used to tell the computer to repeat a certain activity a set number of times. That's a lot of different commands to remember. 
My particular gripe with many command sets of this nature is how unnecessary so many of the separate commands are. One example, you press the greater than key to descend stairs, but the less than key to ascend. This would make sense if up and down squares could ever share a square, but they can't. Why not just use one key or the other for interacting with stairs? A similar case can be made for the capital R versus capital T keys. Capital R removes a ring you've put on, and capital T removes armor. Why not just use one key or the other and then prompt for what the player wants to remove? Granted, in the case of armor, or if you're only wearing a single ring, it currently doesn't need to follow up with a prompt, instead just removing the sole armor or ring you have on, confining this to a single key press. But I'll take simplicity over the lack of occasionally needing to enter two keystrokes any day. Note too that typing capital letters does different things than lowercase letters. As mentioned, capital R removes a ring, but lowercase r reads a scroll. Simple once you get the hang of it, but unnecessarily confusing to newcomers. A final nitpick that combines both of my previous complaints. Lowercase w wields a weapon. Capital W wears a piece of armor. In either case, it then prompts you for what you want to wear or wield. Don't you think lowercase w, to equip any weapon or armor, or ring for that matter, would have been a simpler, more streamlined choice? <sighs> Though I obviously can't speak to every version of Rogue on every platform, Classic Rogue features simple but colorful graphics to represent monsters, walls, equipment, and the player. They're kept small, in direct proportion to their ASCII counterparts, but remain readily identifiable because each thing is one solid color. You very quickly learn to identify each monster you see, and yet I find it more immersive and easier to remember than staring down a rampaging capital T, for instance. Pressing the tilde key also toggles between these prettier graphics and the original graphical interface from Rogue. It's a nice touch to include for those who want nostalgia, though I'll take the pretty graphics, please. There's a lovely introductory title screen to open the game, and a pretty nifty visual effect each time the player descends a level, where the screen zooms in on the player's icon before pulling back out to reveal the new level. It's like a scene splice out of the 1960s Batman TV show. The sound effects are kept simple but evocative. You clearly hear hits your character makes on monsters, and those are distinct from the sounds made when monsters hit you. Rogue undeniably captures, or institutes I suppose, that one more try surely I can win next time feeling that great roguelikes do so well. Not knowing what objects you'll find, or indeed even how many hit points you'll receive when you level up, keeps a constant thread of hope across multiple playthroughs. The brevity of the game keeps victory from feeling unattainable too. You're always just one game away from winning. Final scores. Content. 26 monsters isn't a lot but they're varied enough to keep things interesting. There's a decent mix of objects to find, a few traps, and occasional, almost negligible, shakeups to the map generation. You're always the same character, though. Final score, 3.25. Clarity. 30 plus key bindings with a lot of unnecessary duplication isn't exactly user-friendly. The question mark function to reveal those keys is a nice touch, though, and in the classic rogue version, there is even a minimal ability to use the mouse for movement, which may help some newcomers. The lack of any hard data on how much damage weapons do, even in the manuals, how many hit points different monsters have, or how much damage you're doing when you hit, or indeed how often you can expect to hit, means you're basically working off intuition most of the time. That can provide a sense of mystery, but doesn't really lend itself to strategy. Final score, 1.5. Presentation and Ambience. The simple graphics and sound in the classic Rogue version are great. The images take up no more screen space than ASCII characters would, but modernize the game a bit and help you sink into the world. Plus, you can toggle back to the original graphics whenever you want. User's choice! The opening story in the original manual is quite evocative too, though there's little else in the game that really separates the Dungeon of Doom from any other generic dungeon. As mentioned above, the substitution of description for numerical data does aid ambience at the cost of clarity but it's not a trade I endorse. Final score, 4.75. Gameplay. Kill monsters, level up, find loot, with a nice distribution of difficulty to reward. An ever-present sense that if you just play a little longer, you'll get lucky enough and smart enough to finally beat this thing. The semi-auto movement, control key plus direction, helps cut down on boredom in traversing the same old, same old corridors. The identification subgame adds a layer of interest. The hunger clock keeps you moving, the high score system has a bit of a problem in that its goals are divorced from the goals of the game, 
but you can safely ignore it if you want, or embrace it, as you will. Those constant darkened rooms sure slow things down, though. Final score, 5. Uniqueness. If we're talking historically, obviously Rogue would get major points for uniqueness. Beneath Apple Manor seems to be the only game of its ilk to predate it, and that by a factor of months. But the two seem to have grown in mutual isolation. However, for the sake of these reviews, if we're going to look at a uniqueness factor, it has to be taken in the context of a field that contains hundreds or thousands of competing roguelikes. Not what sets this game apart from all others that came before it, but what sets this roguelike apart from all others that exist. From that vantage, I'm not seeing much. The thing about the rings increasing hunger is an oddity that I've not seen elsewhere. Those dot rec files to verify wins are something I've not seen before either. Final score, 1.5. Our grand total, 16. Thanks for listening, guys. I'm Virtuous Sinner, and I hope you found this review of Classic Rogue entertaining and useful. If you want to play the game yourself, check out the link below. Until next time, bye.